Welcome IED online students. Today is 826 and today's video is for A day on 826 and B day on 827. I'm Mr. Stevens and this is Introduction to Engineering Design. This should be the third video that you are watching for the semester so far. So our announcements today for the online crew is number one, please come in and get your PLTW engineering notebooks. These notebooks are easier for you, will make your coursework a little bit easier than just a regular legal notepad or standard notebook you might buy on Amazon or Walmart or wherever. Um, you can come get these from my classroom anytime I'm here. You can feel free to email me and set an appointment. I would love to meet with you in person and see your smiling face and ask you face to face how, how this class is going for you and how we could make things better. So please do come in and get that engineering notebook. It's free, there's no cost, and uh, I haven't bitten anyone in weeks, so you'll probably probably be safe coming in. Do, do our mask if you come in. I'll, I'll have one on too. Uh, that's the end of our announcements here. So we're going to launch into the lesson content for today and you'll be pleased to know that I've come up with a way to make sure I'm sharing the correct screen with you. So I'm going to go over to share screen and we're going to go to screen number one. Excellent. All right. So we're going to go to our uh, DSD Canvas page where you log in. Go ahead and hit login down here as a student. Once you've logged in and entered your passwords and your, uh, your, your username, you can see our online class. It's the blue one here. Go ahead and click on that. And once you're in class uh, here, I'd like you to open the lesson plan for today. So you'll notice that, that you'll open up to the modules page and we're going to scroll down here past administrative documents to lesson plans. We're going to go to this one called IED Lesson Plan 1.1.1 Part 2 Design as a Process. Go ahead and click on it and it'll open up and it'll take you to this one right here. Same name as the thing you just clicked on. So today we're going to start with ACT prep and we're going to go start with the big fat uh, ACT prep book that we've got right here. And you don't have a copy of this, so I'm just going to read to you what we've got going on. And I'm going to switch and pull out of camera mode for a second and stop sharing my screen so that I can show you a few things from this book. So if you're following along with me and you have the book at home, we are on page 216. And last time we met for ACT prep, we talked about three areas that we're going to concentrate on to be strategic about how we're taking the ACT math test. The first of those was time management. The ACT math is a test is a tough test to finish for the majority of students. Remember, you only get one minute per question. The facts we talked about last time in the video show that you have 60 questions in 60 minutes. So that's about, it's roughly one minute per question. It's vitally important, that means critically important, that you do no more than the number of questions that you can do well. Emphasis on the part do well. To determine a realistic number of questions you would like to complete, think about a realistic goal score for the math section. Are you trying for a 20, a 25, maybe something in the 30? Sure, we'd all like to score 36 on the math portion, which is a perfect score, by the way. But if you, want to do your, if you want to do your best, however, don't be an optimist. Be a realist. If a student who is best capable of scoring a 25 tries to go for a 35, he or she will often end up scoring only an 18 because of so care, many careless mistakes on easy questions. So in class, we had students call out what university they wanted to go to or what college they wanted to go to. And if you don't want to go to university or college, that's fine. You're still taking ACT test here at New Ames. But think about where you want to go. Maybe it's Harvard. Maybe it's BYU. Maybe it's the University of Utah. Maybe it's Weber State. And Google, take a minute, go ahead and pause the video and Google what score you need to get into that school. Go ahead and pause the video. I'll wait. Okay, now that you've Googled and you know what ACT score you need to, what ACT score you need to get to go where you want to go, then think about how, about your strengths for a second. Are you a strong writer? Are you, a, are you strong in English? Are you a great reader? Are those scores on your ACT test going to be a little bit higher than your math score? If so, your math score can be a little bit lower than that composite ACT score you need to get to get into the school of your choice. So now that you have an idea about where your ACT math score needs to be, let's look at how many questions you need to get right on the ACT math section to get that score. And that is going to be your goal. That's what you'll focus on in the ACT math question. You're not going to try and ace it like you do a lot of tests at school. You just want to do well enough to get the score you need to get where you want to go. That's how you maximize your ACT score. All right, so at least in the math section. I don't know how well this is going to come across. By the way, I had IT come and tweak with the speaker a little bit, so hopefully the sound comes out a lot better. 
So if you can see right here, we're looking at the chart that says on the AT, ACT math section, if you need to get a 36 on the ACT, then you need to get nearly 60 math questions correct. So if, you're go, if you only need like a 21 on, the AC, uh, um, on your ACT, then you only need to get 30 to 33 math questions correct. So hopefully you're able to see this chart and it'll tell you how many math questions you need to get right based on the score you need on the ACT test. Okay, if you need to pause it and go back and see that, that's, that's okay too. So if your goal is a 30, you can miss 10 questions. If you'd like to score 25, you can miss 20. If a 20 will be fine for your goals, you only need to answer half of the questions correctly. When we are used to school tests in which missing a few questions can have a tremendous negative impact on our grade, it can be very difficult to adjust to the ACT math test where missing a few questions still results in a top score. So now that you have a goal score in mind and know how many questions we can afford to miss, let's understand uh, three important things. Number one, the math, the ACT math questions generally become harder further in the tests. And this is the example I gave in class. I grew up picking fruit out of an orchard and I love to pick the fruit that was on the bottom part of the tree. They call that the low hanging fruit because it's the same as the fruit at the top of the tree, just easier to get to. Same with the ACT questions. You get the same number of points for answering an easy question as you do a hard question. So pick that low-hanging fruit and answer and try hard on all those easy questions because those are the easy points. Those tend to be towards the beginning of the test and the questions get harder as the test goes on. We talked about that last time in ACT prep and that's just a good, good review for us here. Uh, number two, doing questions halfway is a bad idea. When students rush through the last few questions on the test, they typically do much worse than if they would have just guessed on some of the tougher questions and given a good try to the easier ones. Sure, they wouldn't get all the questions right, but they would almost certainly end up with a better result than they would if they had spread themselves too thin. If you're going to try a question, give it a solid try by reading the question thoroughly and writing out your work. If you're not going to give a question a solid try, don't even read the question. Just pick a letter, guess, like pick C, whatever you're gonna pick, and move on. Don't try to have it both ways. So this kind of reminds me of when I was working at the at Penco products, making lockers for high schools. And I would have 15 or so active projects at a time. And every time I switched projects, there was setup time for me as an engineer. I had to review the file, figure out what style lockers were going in, pull up all the CAD files. And there was a setup time. It was about 15, 20, sometimes 30 minutes, depending on how big the job was, of just setup time to get me into that project to make progress on it. If you're going to go back and revisit an ACT question several times, you're going to take that setup time hit every single time. You're going to have to reread the question. You're going to have to set up your formulas. I mean, you're just going to spend a lot of time setting up and not making progress and getting points, which, which is not what you want. So uh, number three here, then we'll be done with this. Use all of your time to do the questions one time instead of double checking. Rushing through the questions so that you have quite a bit of time at the end to double check your answers is not a sensible approach. If the ACT consisted of questions that consistently enabled you to plug in answers to your equations to check your calculations, then it would make sense to allow plenty of checking time. As we discuss in a bit, the difficulty in the ACT math questions comes in properly setting them up and figuring out what they want you to do. Because of this, you will be much better off finishing the test questions right when the time is called instead of having several minutes to go back and check your work. Again, it's not a hard time thing. So hopefully this is helpful to you as you start planning for um, the ACT portion of the test and doing really well on it. So I'm gonna pause this because I have students at the door. Okay, so we just finished studying on uh, the ACT and doing that portion of our class. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen again. So we should be sharing the lesson plan. Okay, you should be looking at the lesson plan now with me. And we just finished doing this portion. Now we're gonna go down here and we're gonna create our Fusion 360 account. Now before we get started, I know that this may seem like kind of a silly little process, but I, I want you to follow it exactly along with me. There's several ways to set this up incorrectly and it's easy to do. It's easy to set up an account that's not an educational account in which you'll have to pay for the, the software. It's easy to set it up so that you have to download the software to a computer, and most computers can't run this. So we, we've got this um, setting up instructions geared toward getting you the online software so you don't have to, you, all you have to do is log in and use the online software. You don't have to download anything. So 
We also set it up so that you use the correct email address. If you use the wrong email address, then it could suspend your account for 90 days. So please follow along with me and we'll, we'll go through this. So go ahead and click on Create Fusion 360 Account. How, and, it, and it links you to the document called How Do I Start Fusion 360? Now, if that's not working for you, you're not there, here's how else you can find this. You can go here to our Canvas page and you can go to administrative documents. You can come down to where it says, how do I start Fusion 360? Go ahead and click on this and it will open the document for you. So the first step, or the first thing you're going to do is, oh, by the way, let me explain this document. The first portion here tells you how to set up a free student 360 account. Um, that's an educational account, so you don't have to pay for it, and it gets you access to the online-based software. Now, if you come down here, after you set up an account, this portion tells you how to open Fusion 360 online and start using the software that you've already uh, registered for. So let's start up here and let's create our account. Go to this link right here. I'm gonna go ahead and click on this. And it's gonna take you to a page that looks like this. So let's go back to our instructions. And you wanna click on the button that says get started. So we're gonna come up here and click on where it says get started. Not too terrible so far. The next thing you need to do is to click the sign in tab at the top of the screen <clears throat> from the drop down menu. Now here's where mine's gonna start looking a little different from yours because I've already done this. If yours look like mine, go ahead and hit create account, but hopefully you've got a little button up here that says sign in and it's a little drop down menu. So I'm, at this point, I'm not gonna show you how this goes because it might confuse you further. So after you have clicked from the drop down menu, sign in, um, you'll go up to the top, you'll click sign in, and the drop down menu comes down, and you click sign in again. On the next screen, click the blue button that says create account. Once you're there, you're gonna enter your information. Please use your Weber email account. Do not use your DSD email account. Doing so could delay your account for up to three months. So again, use your Weber email account. That's the one that ends in at email.weber.edu or something close to that. Um, when it asks you to choose your educational role, please choose student. When it asks you to choose your institution type, please choose university slash post-secondary. Do not choose high school. I know it's a little counterintuitive, but this is the, I've, I've done this several times with several dummy email accounts, and this is the way that gets you what you want to have and what you need. So at this point, you can click submit or accept or whatever the little button there is that says I'm done with this part, and you'll get a confirmation message with an email containing a link. Now, Autodesk sometimes will ask students to verify their student account, and sometimes it happens at this stage in the process, sometimes it happens later. If your process doesn't go exactly like this, that's okay, as long as you're following your basic steps, you'll be fine. <clears throat> If it asks you to confirm your email, it'll send you an email, go ahead and open it up and confirm it. And it'll ask you what school yours is. If you start typing in the box, just type in WE and it should bring up Weber State University Ogden, okay? I've had one student and then select that. Don't select the other Weber State Technical Institute, select Weber State Ogden. I've had one student who typed in Weber State and it didn't populate anything. And that student had to type in the whole, this whole thing exactly as, as it was written and then add that as a school and then wait seven days for Autodesk to verify that it is a school. So, but for most of you, that should auto-populate. It's gonna ask you um, what your intended area of study is. It'll give you three or four check boxes. Check the top box, it says like mechanical, or I can't remember exactly what it says up there, but check the top box, it says mechanical something. Next, enter your anticipated high school graduation date. And if you're a sophomore this year, you'll be graduating in about three years. And we have graduation in May, I believe. And then complete your email verification. Once you're done, you have created an Autodesk account that you can use throughout your new experience. And you'll be using this in other engineering classes. And I'd like you to go ahead and write down your username, which is the email address used to set up the account. So if you'll pull up your engineering notebook and open the back cover, in fact, I'm gonna Pause, it's hard to pause. I'm just gonna run and grab it real quick so you can see where to put it. Okay, so if you open your engineering notebook that you've picked up from me, by the way, I've only had three or four students come pick these up so far, so please come and get it from me. If you open the back cover of the notebook, you'll see right here, there's a big blank area that says formulas used most often. 
This is where you should record your username and your password for Fusion 360. You can also put it in your phone or in your day timer, but for this class, make sure that everything for this class is right here. So this should have your DSV email and password. It should have your Weber State login information, and soon it will have your PLTW login information. There's a lot to manage, so we ask you to write it down, and this is a great spot for it. All right, hopefully that went smoothly for you. If you have issues that you don't feel comfortable troubleshooting yourself, please email me. It's a little harder to troubleshoot these over email, but I'm happy to give you as much help as I possibly can. All right, so let's go back to our lesson plan. We've completed the Create Fusion 360 count portion. Now we're gonna talk about box plots. And if you want to follow along, you can scroll down and click on box plots and distribution, and you'll bring up the same data that I am going to be accessing. But I'm gonna access it through PLTW's website. It's a little more active, and it makes the definitions that you're gonna need in your notes pop up. So hopefully I'm sharing the right screen here, and you're gonna be able to see what you need to see as you go through box plots. Here, we're gonna talk about box plots and distribution. Well, what is a box plot? A box plot kind of looks like this. Can you see on the board back there? Looks like my head's in the way. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing for just a second so that you can see what's on the board. Let's kind of talk this through. So here we have a regular number line. You are probably familiar with this from when you were in fifth grade or sixth grade and you were introduced to pre-algebra. We have a number one, number two, number three, number four, and finally, a number five. Not too terrible, we should be okay with that. Now look above it, I have up here what's called a box plot. And in the box plot, we have a minimum, which corresponds to one, because one is the minimum number, so one would be our minimum in the box plot. Our two would be the start of our Q1, and we'll talk about that more in a minute. Three would correspond to median, and three is the median because it's the middle number between one and five. Three is that middle number, so we call it the median. Then we have Q3, which we'll define in a minute, is number four, and the max would be number five because it's the biggest number in our number line. Now we have up here this box plot divided into four areas. Between the minimum and Q1, we call that the first quartile. From Q1 to the median, or we could call it median Q2, that's called the second quartile. So this box here is the second quartile. Over here, from the median to Q3, we, we call that the third quartile. Then from Q3 to the max, we call that the, the fourth or the upper quartile. So I just want to introduce that. And then in terms of terminology, you can see a little dotted line. It goes right here. And it encapsulates these two boxes. And these two boxes are called the IQR, or the interquartile range. They're the middle two quartiles. So hopefully that kind of gives you an idea about what this is as we talk about it. So let's go ahead and share the screen again. Make sure we share the right one. All right, excellent. So in your engineering notebook, you definitely wanna have the definition of a box plot in your notebook because you'll probably see it on a test again and you can use your notebook on the test. So like three points. So a box plot or a box and whisker plot is a type of graph used to display patterns of univariate numerical data. I had to Google the term univariate, don't feel bad. And it means involving one variate or variable quantity. So basically, in layman's terms, that's the definition, by the way, on the screen that you need for the test. But in layman's terms, a box plot helps you see the distribution of data very quickly. And this is, it's not so helpful when you only have one to five numbers, but when you have thousands of numbers in your data set, it becomes very helpful because you can see real quickly where your medium is, which way your data is skewed. You can see you know, what your minimum and maximums are, you can see if you have any outliers, all at a glance, and that's a huge time-saving feature. So, now that you've got box plot written into your notes, let's talk about the definition of quartiles that we'll need for the test as well. We've already shown you visually what a quartile is, but the definition here is it's a division of a rank-ordered data set into four equal parts. You should be writing this in your engineering notebook. The values that divide each part are called the first, second, and third quartiles, and they're denoted by Q1, Q2, and Q3, respectively. So feel free to pause this if you need another minute to write this in your engineering notebook. So we've talked about what box plots are and how they help us. The components of a box plot is helpful terminology for you to have. So a box plot, let's see if I can move this out of the way, there we go. A box plot is a five number summary of a distribution. The following five values are graphically displayed on a box plot 
just like we had on the board, the minimum or the smallest is the smallest value in a number set. That was the number one. The median is the middle number. Now, sometimes the middle number won't fall right on a number. It'll find it fall between two values. Let's go ahead and examine a case like that here. I'm gonna go back to the, to the board. Now imagine for a second that my number line here, that remember we talked about went one through five, imagine that it extended out and it went all the way to six. Well, that changes my median a little bit, doesn't it? My median is no longer three. The middle value in here is gonna fall right here on the number line, right there where that X is. So how do we calculate that median? Well, it's gonna be halfway between three and four, and, and I'm not a math expert, but if I take the average of those two numbers, it's gonna give me three and a half. The way I'm getting that is I add three to four, and I divide it by two. Three plus four is roughly seven, and if I divide seven and a half, it gives me three and a half. Also on the number line, you can see that 3.5 is halfway to four. So that's how you calculate the median if you ever, if it ever doesn't fall on a number specifically, okay? We'll fix that when we have the next class come in. All right, let's get back and share our screen again. All right, so we've covered the minimum, the median. Now the first quartile, or Q1 of the data set, we kind of covered already, and it is the median of the lower half of the data. Let's go ahead and look at that real quick. So my number line goes up to five right here. The first half of my data is from three back to one. So right here, that's my first half of my data. And the first quartile is gonna be in the middle of that first half, that's number two. So up here, that corresponds with Q1, and that's where we get that. Now for the upper data, the upper half goes from three to five, and the middle number between three and five is four, and that corresponds with Q3. So that's how we're getting those, those numbers. Hopefully that makes sense to you. If it doesn't, please email me. We can go over this in more detail. Let's see. I, I kind of miss having the in-class interaction because I can look at student size and kind of say, yeah, I'm getting this. This is good. Go on. Or I can have a raise a hand. I got a question, and we can delve into it more. So let's go ahead and share our screen. And maximum is the largest value in the data set or the biggest number. So if we're looking at the number line, the biggest number in there is five. And so that would be our max. Here's a picture of what a box plot or a box and whisker plot, plot looks like. It should be very similar to the one I had on the board, except I had a little dotted line that went over from Q1 to Q3, indicating that that section is what's called the interquartile range. And look at that, as if clockwork here. See, this is another definition you'll want in your book for the test. The interquartile range is a measure of the variability equal to Q3 minus Q1. The interquartile range represents the middle 50% of the data values in an ordered set. So let's go look at that on the board real quick. Let's stop sharing the screen. So you'll see here up on my box plot, the middle half of all the data is this box here and this box here from Q1 up to Q3. And this part is called the IQR or the interquartile range. All right, so here are some examples on how to create a box plot with this data. I'm going to let you explore that on your own. You'll need to know how to do this for the assignment, but basically you order your data from smallest to largest. You divide the data into quartiles, and you can see here from 2.8 up to 2.9 will be your first quartile. 2.9 to the middle of these two 3.0s will be your second quartile. And from this line to this line will be your third quartile, and you guessed it, that's your fourth quartile. And then you'll start determining your five number summary. So there's gonna be your minimum, so it's the smallest number. There's gonna be your Q1. Here's your median. Uh-oh, we have to do that averaging like we did last time. This one's fairly easy. The average of 3.0 to 3.0, not 3.0, not, not too terrible there. And up here, you'll have your Q3. And here's the max, because it's the biggest number. Then you'll go ahead and construct your box plot. And you'll put all of your values in there. And you've created a box plot. Not too terribly difficult. But if you ever need to see an example, you have access to this via the lesson plan, and you can use it when you're needing to create one for the homework assignment today. So how to interpret the box plot. Um, we've talked about skewing data left and skewing data right. Like let's say there's more of these numbers on the left-hand side here. Your data is gonna be skewed to the left a little bit. Some data has a symmetric distribution like the one I had on the board. The spacing between the numbers was pretty even. 
you can have more numbers on the right side or more numbers on the left side. And that's kind of what that looks like. And here's what the box plot corresponding, the corresponding box plot would look like here. So let's go ahead and start our, oh, we need to cover outliers first. So an outlier it, in layman's terms is a piece of data that is outside the norm or it doesn't fit with the normal distribution of the data. So to identify them, we create a fence. We have an upper fence and a lower fence. Just like in your backyard, you've got a fence to separate one neighbor from another neighbor. We create fences in our box plots and anything beyond the upper fence is an outlier and anything below the lower fence is an outlier. So we use a rule of thumb or a little formula to establish those fences. It's called the 1.5 by IQR rule. And you'll need this definition for the test. As a rule of thumb, an extreme value is considered to be an outlier if it is at least 1.5 interquartile ranges below the first quartile, or at least 1.5 interquartile ranges above the third quartile. And we'll do a little calculation here to see how that works so we can establish our fences. Make sure you've got this in your notes. If you need to pause the video, go right ahead. All right, let's talk about these fences. You'll want the definition of a fence in your engineering notebook as well. The limits of a data set beyond which any value should be treated as an outlier. Anything outside the fence, it's an outlier. So let's calculate our upper fence using the um, information on the board here. So I'm gonna stop screen sharing in just a second so you can see this better, but I want to write on the board what our formula is gonna be here. So our upper fence is gonna be Q3, Q3 plus 1.5, Better job right now for board. Plus 1.5 times IQR. Okay, so I've written the formula up here for the upper fence on the board. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing so you can see that. All right, so you can see behind me on the board. Let's kind of zoom down maybe. Okay, but right here is the formula. It's the same one that you just saw on your screen. And let's start putting values in there. Remember, we're trying to establish what our upper fence is. So Q3, I can come up here and see where it is. Q3 corresponds to four in this number line. So I'm gonna put a four down here for Q3. We with, this, with, with me so far? Not too bad? All right, the next thing is bring down the plus sign in our equation. Now I need 1.5, so I'm gonna bring that down. Remember, that's just from the formula. So I've got my one, four plus 1.5 so far, and times it by the IQR. Well, remember up here, the IQR is from Q1 to Q3. So help me count to establish what our IQR is. So from Q1, which is two, over to, up to four is our IQR. So let's count it up. One, two. I count two as I go from two to three and from three to four. So one, two. The range of my interquartile range here is two. So my IQR is two. So my formula, I'm gonna put times two. So I have four, plus 1.5 times two. Now math experts, what order of operation gets done first? If you said multiplication, you are right. So I'm gonna take 1.5 times two, and I'm pretty confident that's gonna give me a three. And I'm gonna take the four and bring it down here. So four plus three, and if I consult my calculator again, four plus three is roughly seven. So seven is my final answer. And that is my upper fence. So any values in this distribution of data above seven are going to be outliers. So that's an example here of how to calculate your upper fence. Now you can calculate your lower fence in a similar fashion. There's an example down here in the notes for you. Let's go ahead and share that screen so you can see it. So here's our example. And you can go through these on your own. You now have all the information you need to complete today's assignment. You're dangerous enough to get all this done, and you'll do great. Here's more examples if you'd like to go through them on your own. I find them very helpful, especially when I'm doing the homework to see how they did stuff. But let's go back to the lesson plan for a minute. And we've gone through our box plot portion. So we're done with that. Now we're going to start the instant challenge portion of, the, of today's work. So um, let's see. We kind of skipped over why we should care and how this helps us achieve our goals. We, we did that in class at the beginning of class. Um, real quick, engineers use box plots and Fusion 360 all the time. And a good example of how I used it at Nutraceutical was one of my 
job was to find out how, what, what size of coder to get to replace our old coder. Now, by coder, I mean a machine that puts a coating on tablets or capsules. If you ever had an M&M, you know that it has kind of a crunchy outer shell, like a candy shell on it. Well, that's applied with a tablet coder. Also, if you've ever had an Advil, you put it in your mouth, it tastes a little bit sweet. It's got that kind of brown coating on the outside. That's from a tablet coder. If you've ever had an enteric capsule or an enteric pill that goes in your, uh, down your esophagus and into your stomach, it has a special coating on it that makes it so it doesn't break apart until it gets down into your intestines. And so it's what we call an intestinal pill. And there's all different types of coatings. There's water soluble, there's solvent based, but I needed to find out what the typical batch sizes were, you know, how many pills went into the drum of our current coder so I could appropriately size the next coder. Well, I got hundreds of thousands of pieces of data in this Excel spreadsheet and a box plot helped me see at a quick view what the average was, how the data was skewed, if there were clumps of data in groups so that I could see what batch sizes we typically run. And what was really helpful was looking at the outliers. I could tell that there was a group far to the right on the on past the upper fence that was always at the max. And I looked at those and it was the same product. It was mag glycinate. And I realized, hey, we're limited on our mag glyc runs by the size of our current coder. So if we got a bigger coder, we could have bigger runs. So instead of just running at 217 kilograms per run, we ended up getting a coder that had interchangeable drums and we could run this up at seven to 900 kilograms per run, greatly increasing our efficiency and reducing our processing time for these, this product. Huge, huge good thing. And instead of buying three coders, I found to accommodate all three of our batch sizes because we had small, medium, and large that went through our existing coder, we were able to find a coder that had interchangeable drums that had different sizes. So instead of spending a million dollars on three different coders and spending a total of three million dollars, we only had to spend one million dollars and buy one coder. So that's kind of a fun little thing to put in your note, in your Excel spreadsheet at work where you track how much money you save the company. So when it comes time to negotiate your raise, and your bonuses, you can bring up, oh, remember those couple million dollars to save the company? What's that worth to you? And you can say that a lot nicer and, and uh, do well for yourself. So why should we care? How does it help us achieve our goals? Well, our first goal is safety first, always and forever. And we are going to ask you to wear eye protection as you're doing this assignment today, because there will be things flying throughout the room. Um, other class goals is to determine if uh, engineering might be a good fit for you. And hopefully as you use these engineering tools and you practice using the design process through the instant challenge, you learn about box plots, that if this is something that speaks to you and you absolutely love, this might be a good fit. If this is something that you're absolutely just not in love with, then you know that, hey, this element of engineering, not for me, but that's okay. That's why we're here is to learn and grow and discover. So how will we know if we did our activity well and genuinely learned? Well, I'll give you feedback on your assignment when you submit it via Canvas. And um, if you were in class, we'd have discussion class uh, discussion questions, but you'll be able to see those at the end of the lesson assignment and ask them to yourself. So let's get back to our assignment. And you can, here's the assignment right here, but you can also find it on Canvas under assignments. Let's show you how to do that. So if I go to my Canvas page, I'm BSD Canvas again, not Weber State Canvas, I'm BSD Canvas, and I go down here to assignments, it's right there, you'll click on it. And you'll click right here on 1.1.1 beanbag launcher. Here's the assignment. Here's what you need to do. And at the very bottom, here is where you submit it. Um, and there's a button for you over here. On mine, there's not one because I'm the teacher and I can't submit the assignment. So that's how you access it. So back to the lesson plan. Let's see. You'll want to complete PLTW's 1.1.1 instant challenges, the beanbag launcher. Um, in class, we had teams formed of two people, not three, not one, just two. And in-person students had to stay six feet apart. Online students, for you, if you would like to find a partner for this assignment and divide up the work and work together, I am absolutely fine with that, and you're welcome to do it. Here's how you can find who is in this class. If you go to Canvas, let's see, let's go back to our online course, and We'll load here. There we go. If you scroll down here, you'll see a link called people. If you click on it, you'll be able to see all the people in this course. You'll be able to, I'm not going to load it up because I have more information than I should share with you about those students, but that's how you get to people in this course. You can reach out to them on email, set up a Zoom conference. You can text, you can video chat, whatever your generation does to get face-to-face -face communication, work on a project, do it, do great things and work together. It's a good thing to do. 
if you want to fly solo on this, I totally get that. That's fine. So the materials you need in class, we have a table full of materials below and we've had a partner go back, one of the partners go to the back room and get these and uh, bring them up. So for this one, you're gonna need two paper cups, a small bean bag, four wooden sticks, about 12 inches of tape, three rubber bands, a binder clip, two jumbo paper clips, a piece of cardstock, two plastic spoons, two regular sized paper clips, and some index cards. Don't get more materials than this, that's kind of cheating. But uh, just wanna make a note here. Use what materials you can from around your house, because I know you're not here and you don't have access to my materials. Substitutions are great. If you don't have a plastic spoon, we'll use a metal spoon. Not a big deal. If you don't have everything on the list, no problem. You can do this activity without having, you know, extra cardstock. If you want to use a sticky note to the cardstock, that's totally fine. Please don't ask your parents to go to the store and buy stuff for you for this project. Just use what you got lying around. Be inventive. Substitutions are fantastic. You can still complete the project. So don't, don't get too hung up on having the exact perfect right stuff. Just get an approximation, you'll be fine. All right, so here is the instant challenge. You need to, using only the materials provided, design and build a device to launch a small bean bag or a wadded up piece of paper, whatever you can find around the house, and send it as far as possible. Now in first period, we had a group send that bean bag six feet, six inches. In second period, we had a team send that bean bag 10 feet, 10 inches. So see how well you can do. You'll wanna spend about 15 minutes brainstorming ideas, and then spend about five minutes building your device, and then spend about five minutes testing your device at least 10 times, recording all of your attempts in your engineering notebook. And we're not gonna do the presentation part. We didn't do that in class either. We were kind of rushed on this in class as well. So um, make sure you document all of your processes in your engineering notebook. Write down step one, define the problem. The problem's been defined for you right here. Step two, generate ideas and concepts. Record all that because you'll need that later on. Make sure you record the distances that you shoot your bean bag at least 10 different times. Once you've done that activity, you're ready to continue with the assignment and do the actual assignment part. So go ahead and hit the pause button, get that part done. If you have any questions, email me, ask questions, not a problem. All right, now that you have completed the activity, here's what you need to do. In your engineering notebook, by the way, you can find this on assignments on Canvas as well, create a box plot to represent your 10 launches. Hold on, I don't remember anything from the lecture on box plots. Not a big deal, don't worry, you got this. Here's the link that takes you to the box plot page that we just covered a few minutes ago in the video, or you can rewind the video. And you can see step by step how to create a box plot. Um, you can look at what one is, it shouldn't be too terribly bad for you. There's examples in this resource and it walks you through how to create a box plot step by step. You should be just fine, don't worry too much. So uh, the next part here is to uh, use your box plot data set to predict the distance of the next launch. Now this is where we haven't told you what to do and this allows you to do some creative thinking and I love this. So using your box plot, how would you figure out where the next launch is gonna go? Justify your answer, write a little paragraph um, in your engineering notebook about how you would do that. That's part of your assignment. Um, make sure you write your name on your device. Well, <laughs> the in-class people would write their name on their device and place it on a special shelf in the back room with a sticky note with their period on it. Um, because we're gonna be using them again. So if you're at home, put it somewhere safe because we're gonna need to use it again. Don't let Fido get to it and rip it apart. Don't let little siblings play with it. Don't destroy it. We're gonna use it again. All right, so you got that part there. Uh, submittals, that means what you should submit on Canvas for this assignment. So each person in your group, or if you're flying solo, that's fine too, should submit a picture of your team's launching device. So take a picture, it goes on Canvas and upload it documentation from your engineering notebook. Remember you get witness signatures and dates or the assignment will be returned to you. A picture or screenshot of your box plot from your engineering notebook. And then answer the three following questions by yourself in your engineering notebook. And submit pictures of your answers. So take a picture with your camera phone or if you don't have a camera phone, borrow someone's in your house and upload it to Canvas. So answer these three questions. And that is the assignment for today. Hopefully that makes sense and it's not too confusing for you and you have the resources to complete it. If you have a problem with any of that, please email me. I try to get back to you quickly, but sometimes I'm teaching class and I can't respond immediately. But I, I do try to get back to you pretty quick. Uh, so let's go ahead and find out if we are getting the juice for the squeeze we're putting in here. You know, like you're making orange juice. Are you, all the work you're doing to get that juice out of the orange, is it worth it? Are you getting the juice? So did you get the learning from today? So how did you predict the distance of your next launch? 
if you had an opportunity, answer these questions to yourself. If you had an opportunity to optimize your design, how would you increase the distance the beanbag traveled? What characteristics of a team are necessary to successfully design solutions to difficult problems? So these are good things to think through. This is some of the learning that you're getting. All right, you're all the way done. Congratulations. Hopefully this video isn't too terribly long for you and we'll see you in the next video. Stop sharing.